The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, how's it going? It's going great. I mean, here we are uh, doing this in person now, I think for the third time in a year and a half. Although this time, thanks to Delta variant, we're doing it wearing masks. I, I still think people can hear us more or less. I, I might be a little bit muffled, but I think, I think that you sound pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You might hear my beard scratching against my mask every now and then, but you know, whatevs. <laughs> yes, actually, now that you point that out, I'm going to hear that every single time. All right. So, uh, so Ilya, who is on the show today? On the show today is the director and DP duo from a movie that I saw at Sundance uh, 2020, so back in January 2020, uh, which is called The Evening Hour, and we have the director, Braden King, and the cinematographer, Declan Quinn, who, someone we really wanted to have on the show for a long time, and we have a fantastic conversation about the movie and about all kinds of things, and that movie is finally now coming out. In fact, it's out in New York. By the time you hear this podcast, it will be out in, in Los Angeles. That's pretty sweet. And so you, this is a, an interview you did in person. I did. I did in person. Are you what, crazy? Well, it was January 2020. Oh, so, man. you know, people were just starting to talk about coronavirus <laughs> at, at Sundance. And uh, I just happened to go into a CVS. And I, I said to the person behind the counter, do you sell like surgical masks? And the person started laughing. He said, ha, ha, ha. We had 300 boxes and they all sold out in 24 hours. Whoa. Uh, so it was already like that's January of 2020. Everyone was already freaking out about it at Sundance. At Sundance, people were freaking out for sure. Wow. And I was like, huh, I wonder if it's going to be a thing. <laughs> oh, was it? Was it a thing? It, 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 looked, I don't, it, it I don't looks know. like it turned out to be a thing. That's so. pretty crazy. Uh, so anyway, <sighs> uh, Ben, what, what's our close focus for today? What are we what are we talking about? Well, in our infinite uh, search to not make COVID-19 close focus every week, maybe just every other week, uh, one of the things that kind of jumped out at us was uh, there was a little news item. Uh, a lot of people probably heard about it. was about Scarlett Johansson suing Disney for releasing Black Widow on streaming day and date with a theatrical release. And it, it just kind of perked up all of our ears over here. And then I noticed Emma Stone apparently is thinking about suing Disney as well over the same situation with Cruella, although she hasn't said whether she will or not. And then it came out that Gerald Butler was suing over Olympus Has Fallen, which is like a seven-year-old movie. Yeah, you know, this is an interesting trend of stars of movies suing studios potentially over underreported or lost profits. I understand that Gerard Butler and Scarlett Johansson are not the same exact issue, but ultimately it's going to come down to money. Uh, money is either being hidden or profits are being pulled away. And I think what's interesting is that the industry has been so compartmentalized for profits and profit sharing for so long. Oh, you get this percentage of the theatrical. Oh, you get this percentage of home video. There's not too many like gross deals where gross dollars are being just you know, all the dollars that come in and yeah. a certain amount of that gets split up. Yeah, it, it's, it's very rare. Unless you're like a Spielberg or a couple other people, it's, it's probably not happening. But the way that the agents typically negotiate for for their clients is to get the best deal possible, to get as much money as possible. And then when a studio decides after the fact that a movie is not going to have a particular type of release and doesn't, you know, se- you know set up some sort of uh, uh, alternative for profit sharing, I have a feeling that some of these celebrities who, who make millions and millions of dollars just, you know, just for showing up, they're going to feel pretty hurt that a portion of their revenue, money that they were counting on, is being taken away. Yeah. I mean, well, and the, and the question is, and I don't know the, the deep heart of the Scarlett Johansson thing, because I feel like Black Widow might end up making more money than it would have made theatrically because the $30 upcharge on Disney Plus. But I don't think she gets a portion of that. Yeah, I think that's, it's, 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 it's negotiated separately. And that wasn't a thing Disney was even doing when she made the movie, because she made I mean, the movie is supposed to come out over a year ago. Yeah, it, it seems to me that the studios always have the reputation of having the uh, the best accountants of anyone in any. In oh, any yeah. So there's no chance that you can prove that uh, movies that grossed a certain amount of money actually turned a profit. And there's plenty of historical evidence of people yeah. suing studios saying, hey, we didn't get our back end deal. Hollywood is famous for this. If you say Hollywood accounting, what you mean is you're hiding all the profits. Uh, <laughs> the, the one that I would always hear used as an example, and I don't even know if this is true. As I'm saying this, this, this just might be an urban legend, was that supposedly Forrest Gump never, never turned a profit. 
Mm. Yeah, it's always amazing when there's movies that, that gross hundreds of millions of dollars, receive Academy Awards, but are unprofitable. Yeah. So, no, I think it's definitely true on the indie side. It's very easy to make a movie that makes no monies that's an independent. But when you're talking about the studio machine and the way that they can uh, amortize and redirect and include debt in all kinds of different productions. And I remember working on a movie many years ago. And the production company was DDF Films. And I was like, DDF Films? That, what, what is that? And how does that have anything to do with this? And the, the people involved in the, in the production said, DDF Films is a uh, shell company that was set up for Drop Dead Fred. So if you remember that movie, Drop Dead Fred. I did, yeah, yeah, saw it in the theater. Yeah. yeah, Drop Dead Fred, I guess that company was still around, and they're like, we're going to produce the movie under DDF Films. And it had been years since Drop Dead Fred when I when I worked on that movie. And I was like, that seems really odd. And they're like, it's not when you look at the accounting and you figure out where all the money is going. Uh. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, but, you know, this, this brings back sort of uh, memories of Olivia de Havilland, who, of course, ended up famously suing to change her service contract, which would eventually then brought down the entire studio system that, you know, actors were essentially indentured servants to their studios Mm -hmm. and they weren't allowed to be free agents and to move around and and everything else. And then that lawsuit was was one of the the, the precursors to making all that happen. So if, if Scarlett Johansson is a modern day Olivia de Havilland, what corrupt system is she about to bring down? You know, I don't think she's bringing down corruption, but I think she's changing possibly the way the accounting is, or they're going to have to do something different for the deals that they make for actors and above the line talent who are generally we're getting a portion of net profits. Maybe it's going to be a lot, a lot more about gross now because gross can be uh, at least gross is often reported, especially when it comes to the theatrical system. Once it's inside baseball and it's you know all going through the streaming services, I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit harder to to keep that accounting. Although there there has been accounting now for how much money Black Widow's already made from streaming, and I think it was like well, something yeah. like sixty million dollars. And as we spoke about a few weeks ago, uh, you know now there is there are Nielsen ratings for all the streaming services. But yeah, I mean I wonder if there will be somehow, if if the Scarlett Johansons of the world, the big marquee stars, banded together and said, like, look, we need a real accounting of how much money this is making your platform, uh, if if together they could make that happen, and that, that would kind of bust open transparency for all of the streamers. Yeah, I don't think that the streamers particularly like transparency, no. but, but if transparency comes, uh, it might be because of action that, that top-tier A-list talent made and uh, decided to go after them, because if they don't make it fair for all, they're going to keep getting hit with, with lawsuits like this. I, I, I predict there's, this will not be, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, and it will turn out that maybe studios won't want to hire some of the actors who keep suing them, so... Possibly, but I mean, like, once you're Scarlett Johansson and, you know, someone wants Scarlett Johansson, there's really only one person who can be Scarlett Johansson, and that's her. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're, kind, they're kind of screwed in that way. But also, I feel like somebody eventually was going to need to open up the books of these streaming services a little bit just so that, you know, the writers, directors, producers, stars, all the people who are, like, putting their reputations on the line – to make stuff for these streaming services can share in the profits. Because I I bet, I I don't know what the actual difference would be, but I imagine that the difference between uh, transparency and opacity for a Netflix or a Disney Plus has got to be hundreds of millions of dollars when you count up all the all the big name talent who could ask them for more money and the kind of money that those people get, you know, and they don't want to they don't want to pay it. Well, you know, the studios might try to start looking for the next Scarlett Johansson, but, you know, I don't know if that, that's going to pay off for them because, you know, it turns out that people who don't have big names don't usually get to open movies. Exactly. Whoever it is that they get, if they built up someone, I mean, Disney has on so many occasions built up someone from the beginning of their career to, to mega stardom, but that doesn't matter. Once you reach that mega stardom level, you know, once you're Miley Cyrus, if you walk, then Miley, then they don't, there isn't another Miley Cyrus. You're kind of screwed. Like, that's who you want. You, you have to pay the money for these people who you turned into a star. I'm using her as an example because she was Hannah Montana and now she's, you know, headlining Lollapalooza. You, you, could, you could also do Zac Efron or any other yeah, you know, yeah, former, you know, Justin ton. Timberlake, you know, any of these other Britney people. Britney Spears, there's tons of them. Yeah. By the time you become a megastar, Disney's not, I'm, Scarlett Johansson, I doubt, is sitting around the house scheming how she's going to do this. It's her <laughs> agents and lawyers who are like, look, they just screwed you. And sh- and, you and know, we want our 10% of how much they screwed you. Of so course. That's, how, that's you know, how like, works. I think she's doing just fine. Yeah. She's got that sweet Colin Jost money. Yeah, that's right. Colin Jost money. He's, he's, he's bringing it down at SNL. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, well, Ben, I think that just about does it. Let's uh, let's get to the interview let's with uh, Braden King and Declan Quinn. Here it is. 
the Cinematography Podcast interview. I'm sitting down with uh, Braden King and Declan Quinn. Uh, thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you Thanks for having us. You guys are here at Sundance with an incredible movie called The Evening Hour. And you just had your premiere uh, last night. And what a great reaction. I, I was in the audience. I heard a lot of comments from people. I want our audience to know a little bit about the movie. Can you give a little sort of background on how this project came to be? Sure. Um, the Evening Hour is based on a book by the same name, by an author named Carter Sickles, that was originally written about a fictional West Virginia town that he titled Dove Creek. And the film tells the story of Cole Freeman, who is a character that lives in a very rural part of Appalachia, spends a lot of his time looking after the old and infirm in the community, but is selling their excess painkillers to local addicts. And when an old kind of bad news high school friend comes back to town, it kind of upsets this fragile balance of life and identity that Cole's constructed. And ultimately, he's forced to take action to kind of save the fabric and balance and life and really the entire world that contains everything and, and everybody he loves. Now, I didn't read the book and I didn't read the screenplay, but there's a wonderful lack of exposition that happens at the beginning of this movie. It's really wonderful to feel like you're kind of thrust into this place and you get the lay of the land really quickly without a lot of the stuff that you might typically associate with a movie, especially when you're trying to set the scene. Is it like that on the page? Is it something that, that how, how did the lack of exposition become become part of this? I think it was like that on the page. I, I, in some ways, I wish Elizabeth was here to talk about the collaboration we had in terms of adapting the book to the screenplay. Um, this isn't exactly an answer to your question, but one of the things I was very focused on that does sort of dovetail with the subject of the podcast is that I was adamant as we went through the adaptation process that I didn't want to see anything on the page that we couldn't photograph. So... A lot of times you can sort of get into traps with internal thought patterns with characters in a script or things that are descriptive, but you can't actually photograph or. And so we put a lot of work into trying to establish character and story through in visual ways. And that carries through not only in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of the lack of backstory and kind of just presenting you with these fully formed characters and kind of thrusting you into their lives. But I think also in terms of how we approached the dialogue or lack thereof. I mean, so much of what we see with these characters has to do with their emotions, their thoughts, the way they look at each other, the way they respond to each other. And that was definitely a goal from the script stage with the film. Declan, when, when reading the script and visualizing the movie in your head, how do some of these like character introductions, how do some of the thoughts of what this movie is going to look like form for you? And did you have any real specific uh, ideas that you worked with Braden to figure out the ways you were going to introduce each of these these people? Yeah, well, I think when, when we first met Braden and I, we found a, a language. We have a, we're have fans of photography, and referencing photography was sometimes a, a shortcut to, to discussing how some, something should look and feel. But um, I mean, I think what really uh, impressed me was the ability to be able to go down to the actual place where it takes place and, and use that landscape, and that was really important. We don't often get that opportunity because quite often, oh, we're going to do this thing in you know, coal mining country, and we're going to shoot it upstate New York, and, and it doesn't have the same, you know, it doesn't... Authenticity. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't, yeah. So, so you're, you're trying to steep people in, in a movie and really feel the movie and feel the characters. So so just the opportunity to go there first and, and shoot in the real place and knowing that Braden had done so much research on that already. He'd been down there the year before, kind of looking around in Virginia and, and West Virginia and, and uh, Kentucky and eventually settled on Harlan County. So that was that work had already been done. So that is a big part of informing characters. And, and I also, when reading the script, I'm a big fan of that non-expositional approach, you know, that you can tell it in pictures and sound. You don't have to hammer people over the head with it. And plus, you want a little mystery. You know, you want things to build and grow and, and, and nuances to reveal themselves, you know, as you go on, you know. Yeah. The cinematography in this is, is wonderful. And I often feel that um, the most successful cinematography is the cinematography that doesn't draw a lot of attention to itself, that just becomes part of the fabric of the movie and you get lost in everything that's happening. Is that ever a conscious choice for you of trying to blend in with, with everything and not become over the top? And was that a discussion that you guys had in pre-production? I'm sure we talked about it in pre-production, but it's always a, a, an important thing for me is to not be showy or glitzy with, with the, you know, to, to 
not call attention to the photography, you know, unmotivated camera moves, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, th- not to say that, uh, you know, we, I don't, I love what the way the camera moves when it supports what's, what the actors are doing and what the scene is doing. So it's very important to me to, to have a reason to move the camera, to have a reason to put a backlight on somebody, which is something that wouldn't run to, you know, unless it had you know, a real important uh, thing to say, you know. So I, I think um, restraint is, is sometimes you can kind of look at a scene quickly and go like, you know, you're always trying to figure out where is the source coming from in this and you just try and use that kind of approach, usually kind of with a single source if you can, you know, keep it simple. And then sometimes you have to kind of adjust a little bit if, if the actors are delivering a lot of stuff in, a, in an angle away from, from that light at a certain point in the scene, you need to think about, well, where can another light be motivated from that feels natural? That kind of thing. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, there's tremendous natural lighting, even if it wasn't actually natural lighting on the day, mm-hmm. but you, you captured the feeling of natural lighting, especially in a lot of the interiors, which I know can be um, very challenging when it appears that people are being lit only from windows or from ambient lighting. So when you guys started crafting a look for this movie, uh, I know you, you referenced photos, but was there any sort of particular style that in your conversations you were like, this is, these are our, our hero tones or our hero colors or our hero light sort of effects uh, what wh- where does where does the look for this project come from one thing that's always been important i feel like in my work whether it's been fiction non-fiction stills you know in, anything image based is trying to give the viewer a real sense of immersion trying to create or capture worlds that feel fully formed as if what you're looking at would be happening or existing whether or not the camera was there And in that sense, I think a lot of what we were doing, much of it was intuitive. I mean, we were on the same page about a lot of things. We knew that there was going to be a certain degree of formality and composition to the film. But at the same time, we wanted to preserve that sense of immersion. Like we didn't want that to get cold. And so what starts to happen is kind of a decision making tree of like, well, this feels right. This feels like the world. And you're sort of chipping away decision by decision to create that aesthetic that you're asking about. When we got into the color correct, something that I found sort of fascinating was that every time we took something into a more stylized place, I felt like we were almost putting a sheet of glass between the viewer and this sense of immersion that I'm trying to describe. And so ultimately, I think a lot of our references became photographic, you know, land, different forms of landscape photography. I showed Declan, I know, a book of Russian paintings from the 19th century that are, you know, very reminiscent of some of the earlier Dutch school paintings, but feel a little more contemporary and and film-like. But really the guiding principle was trying to create images that sort of pulled you into the world and into the screen rather than heavier treatments that sort of tend to comment on what you're looking at. You were successful. Uh, Speaking as an audience member, I I think that that if if that was your goal, you you did a wonderful job. that's, That's really good. So uh, it's been said to me in the past that when actors, when characters in a movie don't have a lot to say, that's when the production design, the makeup, the the costume, uh, the cinematography, all of that really comes forward. When people are just left to stare at the screen for long periods of time where actors are processing or emoting or having a moment, I will tell you, I think Cole's character probably says less than any protagonist that I've seen and certainly at this festival, but in maybe in a, in any movie since like drive, I mean, it's like it, he has a, a ton going on. You immediately have some sort of identification with him because he's a really nice guy. He's, tr- he's trying to, to help out these people, even though he's also a, a, dr- a drug dealer, he's trying to, you know, enrich himself, but he's also doing stuff that he certainly doesn't have to, to do that. When there's so much time when your main character isn't saying something and they're just standing in their light and they're standing with all of these visual and auditory uh, things come into the forefront because you're not paying attention to the words. Declan, in, in particular, what do you think, what challenge does this present for you when you know that everyone's going to be hanging on this image? They're going to be looking at it for uh, and staring at it. Is, 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 there a, is there some sort of trick or something that you want to do that just, uh, you know, makes that character pop? I mean, I think, you know, typically we'll rehearse a scene, right? Before we shoot it, we rehearse block it, right? And then you look for the angle. You're trying to find the best angle from which to capture what's going on in the the scene. So, you know, I'll be watching during rehearsal and as will Braden and and the gaffer and, and other people. And 
you know, so you're looking at several things. You're looking at, well, where should the light come from, first of all? Secondly, okay, it's a nonverbal scene, but we've got to see he's got to come from back there. He's coming forward. Say he comes in the door, like when he comes in at night and um, he gets a, a, a phone message and then he looks out the window to see that the lights are off at, at his grandmother's house, right? That kind of thing. So I think it's 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 about um, finding the right place for the camera to kind of show the scene. Now, other scenes that are more, if he's quietly reading on the couch and, that, and there's that quite a bit of, of reading <laughs> and, and eventually burning. But yes, <laughs> yes there, there, yeah. there's, there's, sorry, not giving anything yeah, away but, here. But, but yeah. I think that's when you're exactly right. I think you can let the photographic image do its thing. Again, a nice composition. There's beautiful kind of wardrobe details are going on. That button's different than that button. He's got the scar from a couple of nights ago. Uh, and you, you have to, you're going to scrutinize it more because there isn't the dialogue that you're trying to follow. So you're going to say, oh, what's out the window? Oh, the truck is out there in the background. So, you know, you, you get more information in every way. So you, so you get to feel the environment, you know. And so I think it's about just creating that depth and immersing the audience as much as you can into, you know, wh- where these characters are living and what they're feeling and hearing. And... Uh, were you looking for opportunities to take lines away during the production? I was looking for opportunities to take lines away at every step of the process. I was looking for opportunities to take lines away at the script stage. I was looking for opportunities to do that during production, and we looked for opportunities to do that when we were in post as well. Um, In a way, as a director, or at least the kind of filmmaker I am, there's almost a liability in being as interested in the image as I am, because I get so much pleasure out of a well-composed image and the information that comes through that, that I sometimes... I'm liable to forget that not everybody reads images the same way. And we're in a moment where because screens are getting smaller and we're in streaming and people are watching things literally all the way down to their phones. And some of this is also due to the advent of digital people aren't really reading images the same way they used to. Things are becoming much more plot and content based than they ever have been before. And in some ways, I feel like the work that I'm the most interested in is almost a, an anachronism in some respects, you know? I'm going to say there's some benefit for that to you, though, Nick, because you really stand out when so many people are going the other direction. When you have something like this, something that's contemplative and visual, I'm not the only one out there who misses more stuff like this. So, <laughs> no. so I think, I think that, I think that that's, I, it's wonderful to not necessarily go with the flow to, uh, you know, make everything as little screen friendly as possible. I, I appreciate that. Um, what I intended to comment on um, was two other things that I think Declan and I worked very hard on during the shoot were trying to, it's not exactly limiting coverage, but we were trying to make setups function for as broad a swath of a scene as we could. So something I'm becoming more and more obsessed with is sort of economy in coverage and making a setup or a dolly move or the way the blocking works function is almost like two or three different shots, like seamlessly make it feel like it was edited, even if it's all happening within a single setup. And so throughout the film, you're constantly, there's a lot of interlocking moves, like sort of on the dolly or following different characters, even if they might cut back and forth, they fit together like puzzle pieces. And some scenes that may look like they contain three or four different setups are actually two. And Declan was a wonderful partner in that because I might come up with an idea for how to lead someone through a space or where the camera might move or how the dolly would do something. And Declan would kind of look at it and go, okay, yeah, that's interesting. What, What if we do it this way? And it was, you would improve everything. You know, I mean, simplify and improve a lot of those ideas that I came up with. The other thing we were doing quite a bit was non-matching reverses. I seem to remember the scene with uh, Everett, and I believe his name is Reese, the, and uh, the sort of the showdown that's happening yes. inside. I, I noticed that happening too with like not exactly matching reverse shots, but you get the feeling like there's something slightly off on this. And it's, I think for the casual observer, what is not right here? It doesn't immediately ring out as like, oh, something is slightly wrong, but it's a it's a very subtle way to interject that 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 feeling of, of unease, I think, in, into what you're what you're doing. It's so, also another example of photographing how something feels. You're photographing it from the subjective point of view of the character and not an objective you know, you're not an objective filmmaking yeah. point of view of conveying information. You know, everything is about like again, it's what does this feel like and how do we translate that into images. We did the same thing, by the way, on the mix and the soundtrack. I mean, there's a lot of very subjective sound mixing going on in the bar, for one example. That first bar scene when 
Terry and Charlotte, who's played by Stacey Martin, come into the bar and there's a big steady cam shot around the bar to kind of establish all the life that's going on and that kind of thing. Well, when they come in, there's a Songs Ohio song called Farewell Transmission playing. It's very loud, big. There's a lot of bar walla. And as the camera comes around the bar and we introduce Carrie Bechet's character, Lacey, and she and Cole start having a conversation, that source cue kind of melds into a more traditional bar mix so that we can hear the dialogue. When that conversation's left behind and we go back out on the dance floor with Charlotte again, it gets really big as we get into her headspace. And so that same idea of photographing what something feels like rather than simply what's happening applied to the way we mix the sound as well. What does this feel like for the character? She's out there lost in the song. The song gets really big. Two people are talking and that's and that song goes into the background and suddenly we're in that conversation. But I don't think you ever notice as radical as those shifts actually are, emotionally they feel correct. So they don't as long as, you know, they're done smooth and so on, they don't really call attention to themselves. Whenever uh, musical selection seems to play such a big part in, in a movie or, or seems to have a lot of intention, I always wonder what was being listened to on the set that day. Were you listening to that same track for the actors and, and rehearsal and stuff? Did you already have that planned out that this is going to be at this moment? Or was that something that, that was found found later? In the case I'm describing, we had the song picked out ahead of time for that moment when Charlotte's out on the dance floor by herself. I, th- I think that really helps then later than if you have to find something thing in post and yes. then you're trying to match those things together. And, and it's wonderful too, that you can carry that through for your actors and for the cinematographer and for everyone else. So they have an understanding of the pacing that comes along with that. Sure. I, I think pacing with that music is, is really critical. Would you say that having the, having that the actual sound that's going to play was, was helpful to you, Declan, when you were, when you were uh, doing yeah. the scene? Absolutely. It's very, very helpful. Knowing the music going in is very helpful for many reasons. One is we can listen to it and we can say, okay, Okay, the song's three minutes long. The scene can only be thirty. Now you may have the director might say it's it's going to be a minute long. I said, well, it's probably in the end going to be thirty. You know, <laughs> it's like so you have those conversations, and then so so you have to kind of truncate it to to a manageable amount of time, and then you, you know which chunk of the song or music you're going to use, and then you know where the drum break is and where the quiet part is, and so that feeds the imagery, you know, very much. So so you you need that help. Yeah. Yeah, and on take twenty. You're like, oh God, we're going to hear this again. That's a, <laughs> I think that, that that happens on set too. So. Well, in, in this case, for better or for worse, people seem to like the music. So it, it went pretty well. I, one thing I was very happy with was that when we were between takes, I did have a couple crew members come over and said, what's this music? This is great. You know, and I said, okay, we're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they were discovering it and loving it. So that, that's yeah. so terrific. All right. So it's Sundance. I'm not going to talk about budget. We don't talk about budget on the show. And, you know, but clearly uh, you had some resources, maybe not all the resources, but you made what I'm guessing might have been a limited budget production look really big. I mean, you've got fantastic locations. You have, I would say, world-class production design and and costumes. And of course, the cinematography is, is, is phenomenal. How conscious were you about trying to maximize the perceived production value when you're out there? Or was it more of that documentary sort of aesthetic of we're going to try to take it in what it is? Or was it like, no, 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 we got to paint this whole mountain red now? So where was your your budget concerns with trying to get a movie to look like this or to feel like uh, something that that really is a is a big movie, even if it was a little bit smaller? It's interesting. I don't necessarily think about it in those terms. Like I, I, the phrases and words that come to mind when I'm in the midst of planning the visual design and the locations and working. We had a phenomenal production designer on this film named Debbie Davila, who works very closely with our costume designer, Carissa Kelly. I think they've done four or five movies together now at this point, which is rare. And they're almost a team. So there's a lot of symbiosis between those two departments. Shorthand, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. And just I think that where my headspace is, is more in that sense of immersion and possibly scale. And I don't mean scale in terms of the way you're phrasing it, like production design, but there's a lot of bouncing back and forth between very intimate conversations and relationships to people and then sort of backing way out to these big searcher scale landscapes to kind of position them within the world that they live in. For me, what that comes down to is not necessarily a conscious thought of how do we make this movie look bigger, but how do we expand and grow the sense of experience that we're going to be able to give the viewer? How do we bring them into this world more deeply? How do we allow them to wander around in the same way we're able to when we're planning the film? And it's one of the great, great benefits of shooting where we were in Harlan County, which isn't easy. It's three hours from the nearest airport. It's not exactly amenable to production, at least in the way 
some people like to think about efficiencies and things like that. But where it really pays off is in the areas that you're talking about. I mean, the, the production value you get out of these real locations is priceless. Yeah. It's you know, and yeah. 180 degree, 360 degree production value, you can, you, <laughs> you know, po- point it anywhere. Well, and, and just yeah. The, yeah, again, going back to that sense of immersion, you find things that you could almost never recreate. I mean, I think that's really the bottom line. I was making jokes with people at some point. There's a there's a scene um, there's in one of the montages fairly late in the film. There's a scene where Ross Partridge, who plays a local policeman, is driving into a trailer park. And I can't remember, you know, there's a sort of a big tracking shot. I know we laid down a lot of track for that as, as we're coming around the corner of a couple trailers and there's some mist in the mountains in the background and some kids riding bikes through there. And I was joking to somebody, I think it might've been in the color correct saying, yeah, we built that whole place. You know, and they, they were like, wow, really? You know how much fun you get into that on a movie and you're looking at tens of millions of dollars. Otherwise it, it it's, I hesitate to say it falls off the back of the truck, but when you go and you find it, you know, that's priceless. That's how you, you know, as it more than makes up for the logistical di- difficulties of being, you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. You get so much bang for your buck. So so you're not on any stages. Uh, did the interiors then present some some challenges? <laughs> because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I, I have a feeling that Reese's place might have been. Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. You, you tell me. There's a whole story about Reese's place. Uh, it, it was an awesome craftsman style house, which had um, the occupant had recently deceased. And and um, so it wasn't in any great shape when, when we found it in terms of photographically. We would ha- had to remove a lot of stuff from all the rooms but we could get in there and we saw the bones of of even the decor the paint we didn't touch the paint or anything it it was already kind of there for us we just needed to kind of bring a bit of clear it and bring a bit of furniture in of our own slightly decaying yes exactly you know and and it felt like ruthie's place you know declan's actually being very polite the woman who had lived there had a hoarding issue and the place was just full of detritus and stuff and was you know there was a you walk through it and you and you do see the bones but there's this question of like can we actually make this work and you know we there was a lot of effort put into cleaning that out but as Declan said the basic bones of the house are what you see I mean the cracks in the walls the the wood detail um a lot of the furniture kind of replicates what was actually in there and there were a number of places we found like that what you asked about the challenges of the interiors and i don't think if i'm not mistaken that there's a single location in the film in which the exterior and interior are the same house (laughs) did did the weather cooperate during your your production (laughs) schedule we had some beautiful weather we had some beautiful sunlight we had clouds uh we had rain storms uh we had all of it uh sometimes within two hours (laughs) you know um so we we certainly had to kind of deal but that's pretty normal with location shooting you cover rainstorm yeah. comes through you got to kind of sit it out or, or, or figure out how to shoot something in heavy overcast or that you th- and then sometimes you lose the sun in the middle of a scene and you have to kind of work out a way to stage the scene so that it won't be a disaster to the way the scene looks you know so um i mean typically in cinematography you, you try and backlight or three-quarter light with the sun when you have a long scene to do in an exterior because you may lose the sun unexpectedly with a cloud bank coming in or you you may gain it even harder when sun suddenly comes out unexpectedly and and your camera's pointing the wrong way and it becomes too harsh you know on faces or whatever so you think that stuff through you know just just um with your sun path <laughs> app now these days and as far as the seasonal feel in the film um it's it's to me it's the beginning of autumn to the end of autumn right it, that's that's the story, um, the backdrop for it. So we were always reaching for the leaves that were remaining on the trees with the red and, and green kind of combination and the sun hitting them, blazing behind Cole, who might be in the blue shade, you know, trying to go for that color contrast that the autumn gives us so nicely. Yeah, so that was a you know important factor. Yeah, it, it almost feels like another character in the movie, the the, the time of year. So I, I was try, trying to to draw this out of you guys because it's like it's uh, I wanted to find out how important that was for the story or how important that was from starting from the script stage. It's like it's it's beautiful in this in this in this area, and you have this incredible production design. But sometimes it's happy accidents. Sometimes it's totally intentional and on purpose. And I just wanted to find out. In this case, it was totally intentional and on purpose to the point that we actually closed the financing deal for the film in the well late in 2017 and we waited nine months to shoot the film it was really critical to me that we hit that 
time of year and peak beauty for that region. I think we've seen a lot of films shot in rural America and Appalachia in particular that are sort of take on a very bleak aesthetic. You know, there's an argument to be made that that's in service of the story, but I think for this story, this idea of spoiled Eden and disruption within great beauty and kind of distortion within great beauty is reflected in the opening shot of the film, you know, uh, was really, really important. And I wanted to show the beauty of the region and sort of what was at risk given what these different characters were going through, you know, what was at risk of being lost, whether it's through the mining companies or the drug epidemic, or, you know, that this was all happening in a place that was actually quite gorgeous and has a huge is very rich and has a lot to offer and you know setting the story within that beauty felt critical to me if someone wants to follow along on this journey or follow follow along you guys do you do any sort of social media things do you insta or twitter or any things of are stuff? in um there is a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and an Instagram. They're in sort of embryonic states right now as we come into Sundance. Cool. But... We'll, we'll find the links and we'll include them in the okay. show notes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. That, so that's okay. great. I don't need to what, go through them. Not, <laughs> not, not, not at all. Uh, what, I think what they're about... all evening hour film. Like, okay. You know, but... Well, say, what about you personally, though? Do you, do you do any of those things? That Do you do either of you do any of I'm that stuff? I'm on Twitter at Braden King. And on Instagram, my handle is at truckstop. At trucks, right? <laughs> yeah. Declan, what about what about you? I'm not really set up yet, but uh, it's <laughs> I have an Instagram account that that I I watch from, but I I, I don't really post stuff on it. But do you have a reel that's like nine years out of date online somewhere? <laughs> that that is the typical oh, yeah. uh, cinematographer. Uh, you know, that, it's like, okay, I've got, so. got a, two weeks off. Should I spend time figuring out how to do the Instagram, or should I just relax? <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. Well, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll put a link to your IMDb page in the show no, notes. Yes, and, and uh, I also have a personal website that's BradenKing.com. Awesome. Well, well, uh, gentlemen, uh, do you, do you already know what's next for you? I assume you're probably going to be, uh, carrying this movie for a little while, Braden, but do you already have a, another project that's, uh, that's percolating? You know, honestly, the thing that I'm the most interested in is continuing to tell these very immersive, geographically specific character driven stories. And there are two that are kind of at the forefront right now. There's a um, script that Elizabeth Palmore, the screenwriter I worked with on the evening hour has been developing. That's about truck drivers that are involved in human trafficking. And there's another story that I've been working on that is a almost a modern day Steinbeck story that takes place in the Central Valley of California that revolves all around water rights. You know, beyond that, the things that compel me the most all have a kind of expedition quality to them, continue to get me out in the world in different ways. And those are the stories I'm going to be chasing down as I move forward. Declan, how about you? Do you have already know where, where you're off to next? Or what you're doing next? Um, I'm, I just finished doing a long six-month project with Mira Nair in India. And we've just finished right before Christmas. And um, I just took a month off and uh, have not set up the next uh, You're enjoying project. the time off. Yeah, yeah. but um, reading scripts and, and meeting folks. Yeah. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show. This, thank, this thank was you. really, really a delightful. It was fun. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so that was Braden King and Declan Quinn. Thanks so much for being on the show. I can't wait to have you guys back in the future. I can't wait to see the movie. Yeah, well, that's going to happen really soon. And now, short ends. Anyway, Ben, it's short ends. It's you know, it's time for our, our obsession of the week. What's going on with you? What are you What are you obsessing over? Uh, I had a true obsession this week. Really? I stumbled across a podcast. Oh, shocker! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is called The Plot Thickens. Mm. We're in season two. It's a It's a podcast put out by TCM. Ben Makowitz is one of the hosts of it. Oh, nice! And uh, the season two is called The Devil's Candy, and it is about the making of Brian De Palma's Bonfire of the Vanities adaptation that came out in 1990. Now, that's a movie that I'm old enough to have seen in the theater and also remember literally nothing about, <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> Bruce Willis is in it. Bruce Willis, Tom Hanks, Melanie Griffith, yes. who were all humongous stars at yes, the time. Yes, it, it was. It had so much buzz. Yeah, and so it's being reported deeply by uh, this woman who was a reporter that Brian De Palma had tapped to, basically everyone thought this was going to be the biggest movie of the year, you know, one of the biggest movies of the decade. The book itself was a humongous hit. Tom Wolfe, you know, legendary writer, had written it. And uh, Brian De Palma tapped this woman to basically chronicle the making of this movie. So she has, uh, she's dusted off all the old tapes, and she has contemporaneous interviews with Bruce Willis, and Melanie Griffith and, and a lot of other people, plus new interviews that they're doing with, 
with people. Like they talked to uh, the guy who was Brian De Palma's agent at the time, who actually died since they interviewed him. Uh, spoiler alert, not that it was much to spoil, but um, you know, who was still sore over what happened over Bonfire of the Vanities. The movie is, it wasn't just a flop. It was a notorious, just off the rails, bad production. Like everything went bad. Casting was dumb and wrong. And it's interesting to hear these interviews, like listening to an interview with Bruce Willis, 1990 era Bruce Willis. So kind of fresh off of Die Hard. He's at the, about the, the top of his career at this point. Though. He's, he's really like this, this real high point. I mean, yeah. someone might argue that, that maybe Sixth Sense or other stuff, he sort of had a resurgence or maybe Yeah, he definitely uh, had a few, a few career resurrections, yeah. but Die Hard was definitely the high watermark for him. And it's funny listening to him talk because he's trying to create this like, hey, I'm just an every man from New Jersey kind of a Near while being outrageously conceited and egomaniacal, and uh, <laughs> oh, no. and uh, I wonder how he would feel himself listening to those interviews today. He might have been like you know very very early thirties, and at that point one of the biggest stars in the world. And it's interesting hearing Melanie Griffith, and they have you know interesting stories like they shot a bunch of it in New York, and then they came to LA to shoot more of it. And in between, Melanie Griffith went and had a, a breast augmentation surgery done, which screwed up the wardrobe designer's entire life. Because all these war- all these bespoke custom h- high fashion yeah. things had been yeah been made for Millie Griffiths yeah. had been made to fit her uh, previous version, and uh, you know just just weird stuff like that. But Melanie Griffith doesn't sound like a crazy person in the interviews. Or there's a story about uh, before Melanie Griffith was fully locked in place. Uh, the studio had Brian De Palma uh, read Uma Thurman, who at the time was 19. Melanie Griffith, I think, was in her late 20s or early 30s. And they had Uma Thurman for the audition do a kind of intimate, not like a sex scene, but like an intimate scene with Tom Hanks, who was in his early 30s and felt extremely uncomfortable because Uma Thurman was 19 at the time. It's just it's a fascinating look at this movie that I don't really think people really think about this movie at all anymore. It's. Uh, There was a book called The Devil's Candy that I think relies on some of the same reporting that came out well over 10 years ago. But it's just interesting to hear it because she's got all of these tapes that she had. And uh, there are three episodes that have dropped so far. And the day that I discovered this podcast, I listened to all three of them. So it's called The Plot Thickens is the name of the podcast. And it's a TCM podcast. You can get it for free wherever you're getting our podcast. You can get it there, too. So, Ilya, what is your short end? Before we get into mine, I got to say that the story that you just described about this podcast reminds me of a movie that you can go watch on streaming right now called Summer of Soul. Are you, are you familiar with Summer of Soul? I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm vel- very well aware of it. Yeah. So, Questlove basically he's is the, the director. He's he, the director. He, yeah, he made it. Well, he, yeah, he he brings he brings it to life, but there's all this archive tape and film footage from this concert that had basically been uh, lost and living in, in shoeboxes somewhere. And here it is all these, you know, decades later, it all gets now unearthed. And in the movie, they do show it. Spoiler. They do show it to some people and they say, do you remember this? And people are like, oh, my God, I do remember this. Who were, who were there? So uh, I think it's really interesting that some of that stuff is still compelling all these decades later. Well, it's fewer in, decades. In a sense, later. I feel like it becomes more compelling because you know, in the case of Summer of Soul or in the case of, of Bonfire of the Vanities, like we know, at least from our vantage, our collective vantage, what became of all these people. Mm-hmm. Like you can go on IMDb and look at, at uh, Brian De Palma's career since that movie. And you can, you know, look at Bruce Willis and kind of see the trajectory and kind of I, I actually feel like it's maybe more interesting today than it would have been to have this stuff at the time. Yeah, because at the time it's like, you know, it's like Tom Hanks, Bruce Willis. Melanie Griffith, like all huge stars. Brian De Palma, you know, at the time considered one of the great directors of that time. And I I feel like probably the only one who still is in basically the same position today would be Tom Hanks. Uh, He won. Congratulations, Tom. Come on down to Hot Rod and we'll give you your prize. You won the Bonfire of the Vanities. But, uh, but seriously, it's interesting to hear stories, you know, just un- understanding, uh, like, uh, and, and it actually relates, they, they talk a bit about uh, the DP, Vilmo Sigmund shot that movie, and Vilmo Sigmund was complaining about these old hags that they cast to be in this movie, and he was talking about Melanie Griffith and Kim Cattrall when oh, they were both in their very <laughs> early 30s. Well, well Vilmo might have been a little bit older than, than either one yeah, of them. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no not, not to speak ill of Vilmo Sigmund. Yeah. He's one of the masters, but I, I think that that actually more speaks to 
you know, a, a norm in the industry That's true. that would not fly today. Yeah, if you yeah. said something like that, you'd probably get fired. If, if the wrong person heard you or you got reported on, you'd be out. That, 100%. Um, yeah. Even if you secretly thought it. But, you know, that's the thing about being a person. You're allowed to think things that you don't say out loud. That's right. Um, the, the, problem is, <laughs> the problem is the saying. The yeah. problem is actually saying those things. Saying or doing things, is, is <laughs> it, it can be bad or good. Uh, <laughs> thinking them is kind of neutral. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you just feel guilty if it's if it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had thoughts that I felt guilty about, but dark didn't, but did thoughts. nothing about. Yeah, I have the <laughs> darkest thoughts. But um, but anyway, yeah. No, I mean it is it really is interesting because you know like Bruce Willis. We don't really even really remember today because I feel like Bruce Willis for so long has just been kind of this clench jawed action star but he started out as a comedy star mm, like it right. was actually a weird thing that he was in Die Hard like Die Hard is one of those movies like Jaws that feels like it rose fully formed out of the earth but it was a hard movie to get going and it, he was a hard sell he wasn't a movie star he was only known for uh, Moonlighting at the time the uh, the comedy show the quippy ass comedy show on uh, TV <laughs> with series with Civil Shepherd exactly yeah. <laughs> and so you know it's like weird to see him at that point in his career so he had already been like the funny guy and then he he was the action guy in Die Hard, but still a lot of the movies and stuff he was doing were things like Death Becomes Her and stuff where he was like doing comedy bits. And Bonfire of the Vanities is like him trying to be like a respectable Oscar winning actor. And you also see, and it kind of made me go, I haven't watched the whole movie again, but it's on uh, HBO Max. So I started watching a little bit of it. And uh, Brian De Palma has the Steadicam op fr- who I think did the Goodfellas uh, the, the famous Steadicam shot from Goodfellas, and they do like an even more complicated Steadicam shot at, right at the beginning of Bonfire of the Vanities. And uh, it's funny how the version of that in Goodfellas is movie magic. And this feels, is, it, with all its complexity and amazing choreography and everything, feels like straight up cinematic masturbation. <laughs> uh, that was Larry McConkie, and yes, he is uh, widely considered one of the best uh, Steadicam operators. Uh, yeah. to, to his work is great. Yeah. I'm not saying anything negative about his work or Vilma Sigmund's work. I just think that someone was like getting in a pissing contest with Martin Scorsese about how far they could push a Steadicam <laughs> shot, and and Scorsese had like a cinematic reason to do it. And I feel like it just you don't hate it. It's just like they're running the opening credits over it, basically. Yeah. You know, it's it's the difference between that and uh, the opening of you know Touch of Evil or something like that it's like there's a real reason to be doing it this way information is being provided to the audience yeah and in this case it's like the same information is being provided and that's that bruce willis's character is a drunken lout well you know it wouldn't be the first time that uh, a steadicam shot maybe went on slightly too long yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, of course. All right. So, hey, my short end this week is I'm not going to go too deep into it because it hasn't been released yet. But but Ari announced uh, the long awaited follow up to uh, wireless follow focus unit. And, and so for people who have been diehard listening and enjoying our discussion of uh, actors and things, this is going to feel like whiplash going into like heady niche uh, technical information regarding, uh, you know, follow focus systems. But we, I know we do have a certain number of uh, camera assistants who who follow this. And in case you, they were under a rock and didn't hear the announcement last week that uh, there is a new uh, WC, essentially follow up to the WCU4. It's something they call the high five, which, you know, I get uh, four to five. And I understand high because it's a really high brightness, uh, high contrast screen that's on there. So you can, you know, work in the daylight and see everything. But I don't want to I don't want to actually belabor it too much because I think for the general audience out there, they're not going to be like super wild about what's going to be an airy priced, really incredible wireless focus system. But they've really kind of gone out of their way to make it like this might be the last wireless system you ever need to buy. And it's not like this is something that you people are changing out their systems every every year. And in fact, most people who, who invest in this sort of thing, it's many years before they pay them back because they're not cheap. But it's a really, really clever system. And we'll put a link on our on our website to Hot Ride Cameras where you can look at all the specs and everything else. But uh, it's essentially designed to be universal. You can use it anywhere in the world. There's different modules for, you know, to be in compliance with the uh, various, you know, versions of the FCC no matter where you go. So you have a, a wireless unit that works appropriately. I was kind of wondering what you meant by that. I'm like, you know, you go to Paraguay and you're like, why won't my follow focus work? Well, it's, it, that that could be that could be an issue, but but also you want to be in in compliance. You don't want to get in trouble. Uh, and then of course they've now added like a cloud feature so that like your settings and different things can be uploaded to the Whoa. cloud. And so then you know you can always have it to recall it. You log into your account and you can pull your stuff down. It's like that's it's really smart. They're doing some smart stuff then. So it's like if you're an AC and you're going onto this job and you've got all of your specific you know uh, picadillos, all the things you want in a certain way. You don't have to really worry about, you know, having an archive of all of your different jobs. You can recall that stuff. You can oh, pull it smart. down. Yeah, it's, re- it's really smart. So, uh, so you know, kudos to Ari. I'm sure that we will be talking about it more. 
anymore. Uh, it's not going to come out till next year, but already at Hot Red Cameras, we have people lining up to pre-order this. So if you were interested in one, uh, we have a bunch on order. I would say give us a call and we will take your money. And then insist on a t-shirt. There's a few t-shirts left. So yeah, you can get one. Excellent. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, Ben, where can people find you if they want to find you somewhere that's not here at this podcast? Uh, I would go to benrockonline.com, and uh, you can see some of my work. Click on some links and uh, join me in uh, social networking. So several people have done it, and uh, that's that's probably the best place. You'll find all, all of my social media links there. Ilya, how about yourself? Where can people find you? You can also find me at Ben Rock Online. That's no, weird. No, I'm kidding. That's so you, weird. Can, you can't find well, me. Well, in there. a sense, you can because I do have a link to the oh, podcast. Oh, do you really? Yeah, oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, okay. one of the tabs on my thing is to the podcast. Takes you right back here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. This is where I'm at basically Monday through Friday. Saturday, Sunday, yeah, no, not so much. But, but sometimes. But, yeah, sadly, sometimes. But but yes, mostly Monday through Friday. And then uh, all the usual sort of socials, I kind of exist at Ilya Friedman. So depending on what version of uh, socialing you do, you can probably find me there, although I'm not on TikTok. I'm not. Yeah, as, me either. I'm, no, I'm just... Uh, I don't Snapchat. Yeah, I, I, Snapchat and TikTok. I, I know people our age who are into TikTok, not Snapchat so much. I, I can't do it. I just can't. I just I, I just don't have enough, there aren't enough hours in the day for me to learn a new thing. I, I can do some cool shuffle dancing, but uh, no one <laughs> wants to watch me do that. So. I, I happen to know that you're great at singing pirate shanties. Oh yeah, pirate shanties. I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty great. So yeah. And uh, Ben, let's thank some people. Who do we have to thank? Uh, well, first off, uh, Ben Katz, whose life we never make easy. And he's the one, he's our fine editor who makes us not sound like idiots and uh, makes our interviews smooth. Pretty smooth. Yeah. Smooth like smooth jazz. Like Nutella. Smooth. <laughs> we should also thank our intrepid, amazing producer, Alana Cody. I, I did an interview with a kick-ass DP right before we uh, did these wraps today, and uh, very excited about getting that one out. We have, we have some amazing uh, interviews coming up really soon, and it is all thanks to Alana. Who else do we need to thank? Uh, let's thank Kay Zalatrachi. Let's thank him. You know, we found out he's thank listening. You, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he made all the music you heard in the show today. You know, maybe we should ask him to make some more music. Maybe he'd listen more. Hey, yeah, Kay, would you like to make us some more music and uh, freshen up the brand? I don't know. Uh, yeah, he might. You now know, now you, that you know the podcast, because when you made this music before we even had a podcast, before we did anything. That's right. <laughs> it was a long time ago now. Yeah, it was. It was 2013. I remember exactly when it was. That's that's exactly right. So, hey, Kays, yeah, you know, you, if you're interested in uh, making us sound different, he's going to change, like, one note and give it to us and go, here you go. Here you go. Here you go. And here's your bill. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, hey, I think that's going to do it for this week. Until next time, uh, thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.